back to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. And it's still Linnea's birthday. It sure is. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, we record, you know, twice in a session. And so <laughs> it's still my birthday. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> and Linnea got to pick this week's episode. I Well, I gave Grace a couple options and because I wanted it to be a little, like, a bit of a surprise. So, yes. So she gave me the option of Anukshuk, mm-hmm. uh, Superman, mm-hmm. And there was another one, which evidently I didn't pick. That I also one. don't remember that one either. And I was trying, I was thinking about it in the car. I was like, I said Superman and Nookshuk, and then I said something else, and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> so I'm glad you didn't pick uh, that one. Yeah. Well, I chose Superman. Oh, hell yeah. So we're going to do Superman today. Let's which talk is about Superman. A great heritage minute. And so far, based on my research, the most fictionalized heritage minute of all time so the scene is like joel schuster or Mm -hmm. joseph schuster i should say who wrote well he was the illustrator Mm -hmm. of the original superman and he's canadian Mm -hmm. hence it's a heritage minute but it's him catching a train to like go show dc his sketch and he's talking to this woman named lois and they're Mm -hmm. at a train station total bullshit like i don't think that ever happened not real it none of it's real okay (laughs) So I'm going to tell you the true story. <laughs> creative liberties <laughs> taken by historic account. A lot of creative liberties. It's so We're good. cracking a cold one. We sure are, folks. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, talking about cracking cold ones, I have enjoyed cracking a cold one every night that I've been watching Montreal play. Oh. And Montreal is headed to the Stanley Cup freaking playoffs. First time a Canadian team has been to the Stanley Cup playoffs since 1993. When they went and won. When they went and won. And um, it's also the the most recent time that one of the original six went to the Stanley Cup was 2014, I believe, which was the Blackhawks. And before that, it was mm-hmm. Detroit in like 07. Oh, no, the so. Bruins. They beat uh, Vancouver. Hence oh, the riots. Also, the riots. I love Montreal. Oh, fuck yeah. They riot just when they get in. Also, like, <laughs> fuck everybody else. We riot. <laughs> just for getting there they rioted just because they were getting to play toronto like yeah, they rioted. <laughs> a series ago <laughs> they rioted in the quarterfinals also montreal was basically like <laughs> as soon as montreal made it to the series, to the quarterfinals against toronto it was like covid's over here do whatever oh, the fuck you want yeah, covid's yeah. done <laughs> like <laughs> Get drunk, burn cars, go wild. <laughs> go full Montreal. Yeah, COVID's yep. over. Yeah, and it's like my family are big Haps fans. So As is my family, yeah. It's, it's, it's just been a lot over the last little while. Because we don't really yeah. follow hockey very dedicatedly nope. anymore. Nope. Um, but, I mean, over the last little while, I'm like, I've had to sit down and watch the games. I'm like, anything could happen. Well, the, the last Montreal LA game, too, when they went into, did they go triple overtime? Oh, when they played New Vegas? Or Vegas, that's what I mean, not not LA. Or Vegas, just Vegas. Because I guess I want to call them... I always think them, of the video game. No, but I want to call them Vegas Kings, because that makes sense, because it's a card thing, like a king on a card. Oh, yeah. However, did you know that when... Because Vegas King... Or no, <laughs> Vegas Knights is the first professional sports team in Vegas, which is hysterical that it's ice hockey, because Nevada's a freaking desert, but like, yeah. whatever. Now they have the Raiders as well. They do, yeah. But yeah, I think... Yeah, they were the they were the first, but well, they've got weird like state policies and stuff, and like Vegas is almost like a city state. Well, is it because of that? I think so. And another very interesting thing is that for their professional sports teams, they're not allowed to have anything to do with gambling. Right. So I mean, there's makes s- it a little hard. <laughs> there's so many good names that you could have come up with, and right now I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are some the that Vegas are better. Golden Knights. Yeah, like you know. It's not terrible, but I love that Vegas, like, really embraced hockey oh. and then did it like Vegas would do it. Like, the production value oh. of a Vegas goal. Like, I'm not a Vegas Golden Knights fan, although uh, Flurry, who's a goaltender, was the yep. goaltender of the Cape Run Scre- Screaming Eagles. He was. I was from. A few um, moons ago, he was. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah a, b- <laughs> a blue moon ago. Um, but he, like, th- that team, like, if I had to go see a live game, 
it would probably Montreal would be first, obviously, but second probably would be Vegas Golden Knights. I just want to see the magic. Probably Vegas. People are drinking beer in the stands. There's oh. like a guy doing. There's a drum. There's a there's a literal knight that comes out on the. It's a it's like it, Vegas. It's spectacular. I mean, it's a show. Extravaganza. That's what Vegas is. Vegas. Yeah. The people in Vegas only know how to do a show. They're like um hockey, but like <laughs> what about a stage production? <laughs> it's like stars on ice. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, but then don't worry, we'll get to the sports thing eventually. It's but fine. But like the the sports are second, right? The right? Spor- it's just it's the show. Yeah. <laughs> and there's probably like a, a six hour pre show for every game as well. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, it's also hockey always reminds me how friggin' phenomenal the American national anthem is. And it's because in it's other song. sports like football, it's you're only hearing the American National Anthem. Mm-hmm. Basketball is pretty much the same, except for Toronto. I mean, so it's not really compared, but in hockey, it's just like you hear O oh, Canada, which is like, <laughs> like O oh, Canada, and that's it. Well, it's especially underwhelming when they do it in the States. Because, right. So they'll sing O oh, Canada, but it's like, O oh, Canada. Yeah. Da, da, and then they sing Star Spangled Star Banner. Banner, and it's just like this production. Production. Oh, and, and it's but it's uh, it's and I know that there is very negative uh, origins behind the song Star Spangled Banner, but God, I gotta tell you, it's a beautiful piece of music. Yeah, especially <laughs> uh, Whitney Houston singing it at Super oh. Bowl. Oh, it's the greatest. Break my heart, Whitney. Yeah. Well, should we talk about an American hero? I would love to. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we're talking. <laughs> this is definitely the least Canadian related Heritage Minute. I think of all of them, this one has the least to do with Canada. Because I, basically the last time you hear the word Canada or anything related is like the first page of my write-up and that's it. <laughs> and then we're done. We're out of Canada. We're out of there. So Joseph Schuster was born in Toronto to a Jewish family. Uh, his father was an immigrant from Rotterdam and had a tailor shop in Toronto's garment district. Nice. His mother was a uh, immigrant from Kiev, Ukraine. And his family, including his sister, um, they kind of like moved around all over Toronto. So, you know, he was he was a kid familiar with the streets yeah, of Toronto. Familiar with the city. As a youngster, Schuster worked as a newspaper boy for the Toronto Daily Star. Uh, the family barely made ends meet, and the budding young artist would scrounge for paper, which the family could not afford. Mm-hmm. So he loves art from an early age. Right. Classic immigrant story so far. Yes. He remembers saying, I would go from store to store in Toronto and pick up whatever they threw out. One day, I was lucky enough to find a bunch of wallpaper rolls that were unused and left over from some job. Oh. The backs were blank, naturally, so it was a gold mine for me, and I went home with every roll I could carry. I kept using that wallpaper for a long time. That's so cute. (laughs) Sometime in 1924, when Schuster was 9 or 10, his family moved to Cleveland, Ohio. So that's the end of Canada. Okay. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I could, if we did the Jackie Robinson approach, which was like Jackie Robinson's, you know, contrib- contribution to Canadian sport, that would be the end of the story. That's it. <laughs> okay. But while he, uh, when he moved there, he attended uh, Glenville High School when he came of age, and he befriended his later collaborator, Jerry Siegel grandfather of jason seagal mm-hmm. <laughs> who's to say <laughs> who's to say i mean probably jason seagal we could ask him <laughs> seagal uh, described his friendship with schuster as when joe and i first met it was like the right chemicals coming together oh which is such like a that's nerdy me. way of that's describing- me and you bud <laughs> <laughs> the right chemicals coming together. I would make a chemistry joke, but I don't know anything about yeah. chemistry. I know geology jokes rock. <laughs> I'm so funny. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got. You nailed it. Good job. <laughs> Happy birthday, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> this is my birthday gift to you. Is laughing at your rock jokes. <laughs> Thanks. This beer is so good. It's so good. It's so better than stone fruit. Like, I like stone fruit, but this is, it's like, It's like my Galaxy and Stone Fruit had a yeah. really good baby. Yeah, like a good baby, and it mm. sleeps through the night. Yeah. We're talking about Tropical Haze from Propeller. Oh, it's so good. Um, it's if you so haven't good. had it, it has the prettiest can. It is one of their prettier cans. 10 out of 10. Yeah, really good. <laughs> so, in January of 1933... Um, Siegel published a short story in his magazine. So now we're adults. Mm -hmm, We're grown. And he has a magazine. 
it was entitled the so the the short story that he published was entitled the reign of the superman Ooh. the titular character <laughs> so <laughs> unlike clark kent uh is a homeless man named bill dunn mm. who is tricked by an evil scientist into consuming an experimental drug the drug gives dunn the powers of mind reading mind control and clairvoyance oh which it's just okay. really funny it's like, what's your superpower clairvoyance i know what you're thinking it's a great drag name yeah. clairvoyance oh <laughs> why has that not been used i don't know maybe it has maybe <laughs> he uses these powers maliciously for profit and amusement oh superman's bad yes so he's like a, so this is the first time superman the the word is used not cool um yeah and so he's like a lex luther looking guy who's evil and then he's basically like a vagrant who then uses his powers to like get food and money so he's not a vagrant anymore hmm. relatable content i yeah. mean that's what we would all do for sure <laughs> for sure but not you know the stuff of comic books today yes yeah <laughs> schuster provided the illustrations uh, depicting Dunn as a bald man um, so you can tell that the heritage minutes interpretation of the first rendering of superman very different which was like the 1990 superman yeah <laughs> siegel and schuster shifted to making comic strips so initially they do a book but now they're like we're gonna do comic strips because they were like easier to get into syndicated newspapers yeah. and they were having a lot of success in the 1930s um however newspaper editors told them that their ideas weren't sensational enough if they wanted to make a successful comic strip, it had to be something more sensational than anything else on the market. We don't have to sensationalize everything. Just <laughs> leave them be. Let them have their fun. Yeah. I'm just going to make paper mache out of it anyways. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this prompted Siegel to revisit Superman as a comic strip character. Siegel modified Superman's powers to make him even more sensational. Okay. So, like Bill Dunn, the second prototype of Superman is given powers against his will by an unscrupulous scientist. But instead of psychic abilities, he acquires superhuman strength and bulletproof skin. Oh. So, we're getting a little closer to, to what Superman's powers are. Because the original are. Superman couldn't fly. Yes. He can just leap over tall buildings in a single bound. In a bound. single bound. Yeah. He's faster than a speeding bullet. Yeah. Or is it a train? More, no, it's faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Yeah. Can jump over tall buildings in a single bound. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Superman. Superman. It's also so monotone. <laughs> it's Superman. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Additionally, this new Superman was a crime-fighting hero instead of a villain. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> because Siegel noted that comic strips with heroic protagonists tended to be more successful. It's what the people want. <laughs> I want an awful protagonist. Yeah, we want a feel-good story. <laughs> in later years, Siegel once recalled that this Superman wore a bat-like cape in some panels, but typically he and Schuster agreed that there was no costume yet designed. Okay. So Siegel and Schuster showed this second attempt of Superman to Consolidated Book Publishers, based in Chicago. In May of 1933, Consolidated had published a proto-comic book entitled Detective Dan, Secret Operative 48. What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I like the number choice. It's like, what's a sexy number? 007? Mm, no. 48. <laughs> That's how old he is. Uh, <laughs> Secret operative, middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> it contained all original stories as opposed to reprints of newspaper strips, which were a, was a novelty at the time. So typically a okay. comic book would just be all the strips from the paper put together uh, instead okay. of like, this is a, a unique run. Fresh content. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A delegation from Consolidated visited Cleveland that summer on a business trip, and Siegel and Schuster took the opportunity to present their work in person. Although Consolidated expressed interest, they later pulled out of the comic business without ever offering a book deal because the sales of Detective Dan were disappointing. <laughs> I wonder I'm why. I'm shocked. <laughs> 
Siegel believed publishers kept rejecting them because he and Schuster were young and unknown. So he looked for an established artist to replace Schuster. Oh. Oh, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. So we're done with Schuster now? <laughs> we'll get to it. Who's, who's this hair? Currently, the about? band is breaking up. <laughs> for the moment, for the time being, the band is breaking up. Okay. When Siegel told Schuster what he was doing, Schuster reacted by burning the rejected Superman comic, sparring only the cover. They continued collaborating on other projects, but for the time being, Schuster was through with Superman. Superman was dead. Okay. Because of this outburst, there apparently only have there are only two surviving sketches of the original Superman draft, hmm. which are probably like the most valuable comic memorabilia in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Independently, Siegel wrote to numerous artists. So now he's like trying to find Schuster's replacement. His first response came in July of 1933 from Leo Omelia, who drew the Fu Manchu strip for Bell Syndicate. Oh. I'm sure it wasn't racist at all. Uh, no, definitely not. In the script that Siegel sent Omelia, Superman's origin story changes. So he is now a scientist adventurer from the far future when humanity has naturally evolved superpowers. <laughs> just before Earth explodes, you know, I don't know what the build up to that event was, but just before Earth explodes, he escapes in a time machine to the modern era, whereupon he immediately begins using his superpowers to fight crime. Let me guess, it's 1982. I like that mm. he's traveling back in time, not trying to, you know, like avoid whatever happened to blow up the earth but just fight petty crime yeah. instead <laughs> you robbed grandma i've gotta get you <laughs> yeah like it's that. like you know i could try and you know address the global you know climate crisis but there are grandma thieves everywhere it sounds like a lot of work <laughs> it sounds like a lot of work i'm not into that <laughs> Amelia produced a few strips and showed them to his newspaper syndicate, but they were rejected, and Amelia did not send Seagull any copies of his strips, and so those have also been lost. Shitty. In June of 1934... Ooh, June 26th, perhaps? Perhaps. Perhaps. Definitely, <laughs> definitely in and around that time okay. of Linnea's birthday okay. uh, in the past, Seagull found another partner, oh. an artist in Chicago named Russell Keaton. Keaton drew the Buck Rogers and Sky Rhodes comic strips. In the strip that Seagull sent to Keaton in June, Superman's origin story further evolved. In the distant future, when Earth is on the verge of exploding, <laughs> due to, quote, giant cataclysms. <laughs> okay. The last surviving man sends his three-year-old son back in time to the year 1935. Mm. So we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting We're getting somewhere. closer. The time machine appears on a road where it is discovered by motorists Sam and Molly Kent. They leave the boy in an orphanage, but the staff struggle to control him because of his superhuman strength and impenetrable skin. The Kents adopt the boy and name him Clark and teach him that he must use his fantastic natural gifts for the benefit of humanity. Okay, this is getting very close to the Superman story we yes. know and love or not love, but at least know today. We're basically only missing Krypton. We're missing that it wasn't Earth. It was another planet. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite time travel. No, it's just our planet's going to explode just go far away. Earth. Earth is safe. Due to giant cataclysms. Yeah. <laughs> In November, Siegel sent Keaton an extension of his script, an adventure where Superman foils a conspiracy to kidnap a star football player. Not good. <laughs> the extended script mentions that Clark put on a special uniform when assuming the identity of Superman, but a it uniform. is not described. So we don't know what the uniform is. He's, it could be anything. He pulls a... Papa John's uniform. <laughs> so he pulls a Samuel L. Jackson. And he's like, where's my super suit? <laughs> I literally say that every day. I love whenever, that. Whenever Eric is missing anything, I go, what? And he goes... He just like... He's like, what? He's like, where is my, my super, super suit? suit? <laughs> I need it. That's so good. Samuel L. Jackson is such a great actor. And that is definitely not like I feel like the, you know, epitome of his it's work as an actor. But damn, that's funny. That's a funny bit. It's one of the best pieces of voice acting ever. Oh, ever. You don't even see him. You just see him like running around the bedroom. So it's yeah. really just these two voices. Yeah. And it's really just Samuel L. Jackson 
and this I don't know who the woman is who plays his wife no. um, but she does a phenomenal job as well but it's just Samuel L. Jackson has such a recognizable voice yeah. that it's like to hear him being like it's like you know he's either talking about snakes getting off a plane or he's like that's like the two <laughs> things suits. I identify him with <laughs> yeah. my favorite my favorite line is uh, in that like whole movie is like don't you be going out doing those daring do's <laughs> such like, a good movie we've been planning this dinner for six months absolutely yeah. absolutely oh he's so funny <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically he eventually shows these like stories to keaton and in november keaton showed uh his strip to a newspaper syndicate but they also rejected it and then keaton abandons the project so oh. basically they're just not getting picked up by anybody sure. and so at this point siegel and schuster reconcile and resume developing superman together good the character became an alien from the planet Krypton. Better. Schuster designed the now familiar costume. Tights with an S on the chest, overshorts, and a cape. Overshorts. Overshorts. They're not underwear. They're, They're overshorts. Over <laughs> it's the cape. The cape is what really, yeah. They really should be over tights because that's it's what they're It's a bodysuit. He's wearing He's a wearing a cat suit. suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they make Clark Kent a journalist who pretends to be timid and conceived his colleague Lois Lane who is attracted to the bold and mighty Superman, but does not realize that he and Kent are the same person. Like every good superhero romance. Absolutely. Minus Thor. <laughs> that one's Minus obvious. Thor. <laughs> She's like, I know exactly who you are. It's like, fuck, Natalie Portman, you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> you're so small and smart. You're so small <laughs> and smart. It makes me so angry, but I love you. <laughs> and space. But also history and science. Together. I don't know. <laughs> Myth. <laughs> The Thor movies are funny. <laughs> For anyone who hasn't started the Loki um, show mm. on uh, Disney Plus, it's really good. Oh, I'll give you my. Oh yeah, I, I'll give you my Disney Plus password. You can watch whatever you want. Oh my god! The other day I was drunk in bed, just reciting Winnie the Pooh. Oh well, now you don't I'll have just, to be drunk. Now I don't have to be drunk. I can just do it sober. Or you can be drunk and watch it and <laughs> recite it along cry. with it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing makes me cry more than Winnie the Pooh. God, I love Winnie the Pooh. It's so good. Uh, I don't know. There's a Charlie Brown episode where there's a girl who has cancer and she dies. You were telling me about that one time. Mm, it's yeah. tragic. Why do kids shows at some point, they're like, all right, now that we've built <laughs> trust with you, let's devastate you emotionally. And it's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, that's I guess smart. so. <laughs> that's smart. Anyway, um, so aside from that, yes, Winnie the Pooh is emotional. We can watch The Incredibles. Hell yeah. <sighs> so good what a yeah. great movie anyways moving on <laughs> moving on in june 1935 siegel and schuster finally found work with the national allied publications a comic magazine publishing company in new york owned by malcolm wheeler nicholson <laughs> i just realized that national allied publications the abbreviation for that is nap <laughs> <laughs> which is what i want right They're now sleeping on the job <laughs> Were you napping again? I'm just like, <laughs> wink, wink. I'm doing a serious job. It's like, <laughs> sure. Sure. Wheeler Nicholson published two of their strips in New Fun Comics, number six. Cool. <laughs> so the first things that get published are called Henry Duvall and Dr. Occult. Okay. So these are other things that they're working on. They get published before Superman. I don't know about them. Clearly, they weren't that good. <laughs> Clearly, it didn't pan out. Every, like, comic nerd is like, oh, my God. What do you mean? It's the history of comics. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Hunter from North of Normal is yeah. listening to our ignorance right now. Hunter and, is uh, banging <laughs> his hands against his head. We're so sorry, yeah, Hunter. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Siegel and Schuster also showed him Superman and asked him to market Superman to newspapers on their behalf. In October, Wheeler and Nicholson, or Wheeler Nicholson, hyphenated names. It's hard. <laughs> it's the future. Everybody's got hyphenated names now. There's a kid at my mom's school. My mom works at an elementary school uh, that has four names because it's a double hyphenation. And I'm like, that's dumb. It's too much. Yeah. So they use the letters of the first two. So like, say it's, mm. yeah, say it's like McNutt, Swinimer, Nickerson oh Jones, McNutt, Swinimer, Nickerson Jones, they're MS. Nickerson and Jones. J Nickerson Jones. Yeah, MS Nickerson Jones. Nickerson Jones is just a good name. Yeah, just take that. That's cute. It's <laughs> cute. This is my child, Nickerson Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Little Nicky J. <Jay. laughs> 
In October, Wheeler Nicholson published uh, offered to publish Superman in one of his own magazines. Mm. Siegel and Schuster refused his offer because Wheeler Nicholson had demonstrated himself to be an irresponsible businessman. Oh, man. <laughs> He had been slow to respond to their letters and hadn't paid them for their work with new fun comics number six, so what they had previously published. Right. They chose to keep marketing Superman to newspaper syndicates themselves. Despite the erratic pay, Siegel and Schuster kept working for Wheeler Nicholson because he was the only publisher who was buying their work, and over the years they produced other adventure strips for his magazines. Oh. Wheeler Nicholson's financial difficulties continued to mount. In 1936, he formed a joint corporation with Harry Donafeld and Jack Leibowitz called Detective Comics, Inc., in cool. order to release his third magazine, which was titled Detective Comics. Now, speaking of initials, Detective Comics. <gasps> oh, DC. All coming together. It's hilarious that it's called Detective Comics. Is that what DC stands for? Yep. Shut up. Yep. <laughs> Detective Comics? Yep. So when people say DC Comics, they're saying Detective Comics that's Comics. That's lame. <laughs> oh, DC. <laughs> DC. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Which would be why I feel like real comic people call it DC. Yeah. Because you have Marvel Comics and they DC. Because they know. Because they know. They're in the loop. Yeah, they District know. District of I Columbia. I bet Hunter knows that. <laughs> Siegel and Schuster produced stories for Detective Comics, too, such as Slam Bradley. <laughs> what? I don't know. I'm still it's laughing over I'm still laughing over DC. It's Washington. It's comics. It's It's, it's everything it's, you ever wanted. It's three letters away from BC. <laughs> Two letters away from <laughs> BC. Three letters. <laughs> Oh, in the alphabet. Sorry, yes. I thought you were like at it. I was like, there's only two letters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, no. The alphabet does. No. <laughs> Wheeler Nicholson fell into deep debt uh, um. to the other two partners uh, in, in D.C. And so in early January 1938, they petitioned to have Wheeler Nicholson's company uh, put into bankruptcy and they seized it. So Sorry, now, buddy. So now Wheeler Nicholson's out. He gone. You're not part of the team anymore. Cut. Schuster remembered, quote, One was drawn on brown wrapping paper, and the other was drawn on the back of wallpaper from Toronto. And DC approved them. And just like that, it's incredible. But DC did say, we like your ideas, we like your scripts, and we like your drawings. But please, copy over the stories in pen and ink on good paper. Oh. <laughs> so I got my mother and my father to lend me some money to go out and buy some decent paper the first drawing paper I ever had in order to submit these stories properly to DC Comics. Well, because that's an interesting thing. I Like, I mean, I at least don't think about that, and I don't know if it's done this way, but when comics first started, this is a fun fact I know from a university course I took. Thank you, Acadia, for all of my debt and this one tidbit of knowledge, <laughs> um, is that so the illustrators for comics also did all the writing, Mm. um like it wasn't like they hand wrote so they the, hand yeah. wrote all of the text for comic strips so it's like someone else had written it and they copied over but still like it was very hard because at, at that time you know it wasn't like typewriters or like printers like it wasn't comic sans it wasn't a text well, that's where comic machine. sans comes from yeah right? it, but it's actually like the writing that you made similar to like other it was like basically drawing a letter oh okay. so it was like you draw the picture then you draw the letter because that's comic right. book text right yeah so like it's a lot of work yeah no it's like grueling work yeah. too it's not fun for the most part yep. i'm sure in early december 1937 siegel visited Leibowitz in new york and Leibowitz asked siegel to produce some comics for an upcoming comic anthology magazine called action comics siegel proposed some new stories but not superman Siegel and Schuster were at the time negotiating a deal with mcclure newspaper syndicate for superman in early January 1938, Siegel had a three-way telephone conversation <laughs> with Leibowitz and an employee of McClure no named Max Gaines. Ooh. That is a porn name. That's a porn name? A or drag like a, name? A weightlifter? That's a name. Max Gaines. Max Gaines. <laughs> Gaines informed Siegel that McClure had rejected Superman and asked if he could forward their Superman strips to Leibowitz so that Leibowitz could consider them for action comics. Siegel agreed. Leibowitz and his colleagues were impressed by the strips and they asked Siegel and Schuster to develop the strips into 13 pages for action comics. Hmm. 
Having grown tired of rejections, Siegel and Schuster accepted the offer. At least now they could see Superman published. Siegel and Schuster submitted their work in late February and were paid $130, equivalent to $2,039 in 2020 money for their I, work. I hope that's $10 each. $10 a page. I hope that's each. <laughs> Probably. Uh. I don't think so. In early March, they signed a contract at Leibowitz's request in which they gave away the copyright for Superman to Detective Comics, Inc., this was normal practice in the business, and Siegel and Schuster had given away the copyrights to their previous works as well. Mm. The duo's revised version of Superman appeared in the first issue of Action Comics, which was published on April 18, 1938, concluding their six-year quest to find publication for Superman. The issue was a huge success thanks to Superman's feature. Oh. So, Superman as we know him was derived from many influences. Siegel and Schuster read pulp science fiction and adventure magazines, and many stories featured characters with fantastical abilities such as telepathy, clairvoyance, and superhuman strength. One Superman's not a clairvoyant. No. No, no, no. Okay, no. I was like, I've watched the movies. Like, I'm they'll pretty sure. They'll, they'll just give him random superpowers sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. In just a movie, it's like, eh. No, it's true. They're like, oh, yeah, he, he can do that. Yeah, he can fly. Yeah, it's fine. Sure. It's cool. One character in particular was John Carter of Mars from the novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs. John Carter is a human who is transported to Mars where the lower gravity makes him stronger than the natives and allows him to leap great distances. Is there lower gravity on Mars? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Because it's a smaller planet, and so I think its gravitational pull would be less. Would be less, but not a whole lot less. Yeah. I think it's comparable, but different. Yeah. Because it's definitely less on the moon. The moon is way smaller. I haven't been, but I've heard gravity is really? way less on the moon. Me either. They turned down the gravity. We should take a field trip. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Call up Tesla. Get us hey. on that ship. Hey, Musk. <laughs> Let me go to the moon. Elon, my buddy. <laughs> so uh, Superman's stance and devil may care attitude <laughs> were influenced by the characters of Douglas Fairbanks. Uh, so he was starred in, like, The Mark of Zorro and Robin Hood. Oh, I know who Douglas Fairbanks is. Do you? <laughs> I oh, didn't. Oh, my Nana has a very, very, my Nana, God love my <laughs> Nana, has a very, very, very old Douglas Fairbanks collection of uh, of Douglas Fairbanks memorabilia, such as movie posters. That's hilarious. Such as the original Mask of Zorro. There you before go. Before Antonio Banderas took over the mask. Yes. And the sword. And the Z formation. Yeah. And so, like, his posture is based off that. It's true. It's hands <laughs> on hips, 24-7. <laughs> the, the home city that Superman lives in, Metropolis, was just taken from the movie Metropolis. Oh, okay. That came yeah. out in 1927. If you know that weird, like, that robot black and white movie. <laughs> okay. It's that. Uh, Clark Kent's harmless facade and dual identity were inspired by protagonists such as Zorro. <gasps> Um, and Sir Percy Blankley in the Scarlet Pimpernel. Pimpernel? Not the Scarlet Letter? I'm sure it was great. No. Nope. <laughs> okay. I was like, so I know that sounds one. Sounds like a great movie. That's about a hoe. Siegel thought this would make for interesting, dramatic contrast and good humor. Okay. Another inspiration was the slapstick comedian Harold Lloyd. Okay, because the truth is I don't find Superman that funny. Yeah, no, I agree. I think so. The, the slapstick comedian was the archetype for Clark Kent. Oh, and okay. then Superman is inspired, so it's supposed okay, to be like look at this it. contrast. It's crazy. Look at look at this crazy contrast. Like if I was gonna pick a slapstick comedian of a superhero, I would go to the Marvel universe and say like Spider Man because he's young. Because he's young, so he's, he's like he's like gawky and like he does silly things. Yeah. And, like, then like Thor, just because. Thor. They just made Thor funny. Thor is a comedy. And then definitely Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, they're all hilarious. They're all so it's funny. It's a great movie. Great soundtrack. Oh, bomb soundtrack. <laughs> Kent was made a journalist because Siegel just often imagined that's what he would become. Okay. Uh, and then the love triangle between Lois Lane, Clark Kent, and Superman, which isn't really a that's love triangle, a triangle, but uh, was inspired by Siegel's own awkwardness with girls. Good for you. Siegel sounds like an incel before incels were a thing. Yeah, Siegel sounds <laughs> like a loser. 
So stylistically, uh, Superman had a lot of influences as well. The tight-fitting suit yes. and shorts yes. were inspired by the costumes of wrestlers, boxers, and strongmen. I was going to say Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, yeah, yeah like, very much. Like, oh, the beach. It's that that way. away. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> if you guys don't know which way the beach is, then you you're know, missing out. You're missing out. In early concept art, Schuster gave Superman laced sandals. I hate so like that. Greek sandals, like basically. Hercules. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, but these were eventually changed to red boots. Good. The costumes of Douglas Fairbanks were also the influence for his costume, oh. particularly the cape. Yeah. So like the long flowing cape, um, and the emblem on his chest was just taken from athletic teams. They're like, well teams have things on the chest so maybe superman should too that'd be a good idea <laughs> just slap it right there between yeah. his titties just put it right there <laughs> oh he looks great <laughs> many pulp action heroes uh such as swashbucklers no thanks you know uh they wore capes so that's okay. superman gets a cape too and then like his face and his hair were kind of taken from like dick tracy styles. yeah okay okay yeah. The quaff. The word Superman was actually a commonly used word in the 1920s and 1930s, and they were just describing men of great ability. Okay. Uh, so most athletes and politicians, they would just get called Superman. Superman. So in 1946, so like Superman is a crazy popular comic. It, it takes off. Okay. People love it. It has a consistent run. But in 1946, near the end of their 10-year contract to produce Superman stories, Siegel and Schuster sued Detective Comics, Inc. Whoa. Because their contract annulled and they wanted to regain the rights to Superman. So, like, basically they're saying you had the copyright to Superman for our, the duration of our contract. Yeah. But now that our contract is coming to an end, we want it back. We want Superman back. The following year, the New York State Supreme Court ruled that the publisher had validly purchased the rights to Superman when it bought the first Superman story, saying the duo had, quote, transferred to D.C. all their rights in and to the comic strip Superman, including the name, title, characters, and conception. Oh. So at this point, they basically are like, well, we're done with D.C. Comics, and so D.C. Comics continues to make... Superman without Siegel and Schuster. Oh. So basically only like the first 10 years of the publication are actually their work and the rest of it is just somebody else oh. writing the stories of Superman and drawing him. Oh, that's lame. <laughs> so Schuster continued to draw comics. He basically, he went on and did like a bunch of different things. Uh, comic historian Ted White wrote that Schuster continued to draw horror stories into the 1950s. Okay. Um, Schuster was also the anonymous illustrator of The Knights of Horror, an underground sadomasochist fetish paperback book series. Jesus. I know. That's it's weird. In, in 1954, <laughs> Knights of Horror garnered controversy because of its involvement in the trial of the Brooklyn Thrill Killers. Oh, no. Where it was alleged by psych psychiatric expert and anti-comics crusader Frederick Wertham worth them that gangs lead the gang's leader had read the books and that was why he had committed the crime anti-comic crusaders anti-comic crusader <laughs> i mean that's not me but that's a fun title <laughs> the knights of horror series was seized and banned in the state of new york and the case eventually went to the supreme court however the book's artist was never identified at the time it was only in 2004 when gerard jones revealed that schuster had drawn the books that everybody found out about crazy. it crazy the claim was backed in 2009 by comics historian Craig Yo. Mm -hmm. This was based on character character similarities and the comparison of the artistic style between illustrations and those of Superman. Right. So they basically were really like, "Look at the writing. <laughs> it's, it's on him. the wall." <laughs> in 1964, when Schuster was living on Long Island with his elderly mother, he was reported uh, to be earning his living as a freelance cartoonist. He was also, quote, trying to paint pop art, serious comic strips, and hoped eventually to promote a one-man show in some chic Manhattan gallery. Hmm. At one point, his worsening eyesight prevented him from drawing, and he worked as a delivery man in order to earn a living. Aww. Jerry Robinson claimed Schuster had delivered a package to the D.C. building, embarrassing the, the employees. So he's, he shows up, but he shows up to the building. He's like, I, it sounds like he's making fun of them. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, oh, it's so embarrassing that Schuster's here. Yeah. 
He was summoned to the CEO, given $100, and told to buy a new coat and find another job. Oh. By 1976, Schuster was almost blind and living in, at a California nursing home. Oh. By what year? By 1976. Okay. In 1967, so back in time, when the Superman copyright came up for renewal, Siegel launched a second lawsuit, which also proved unsuccessful. In 1975, Siegel launched a publicity campaign in which Schuster participated, protesting DC Comics' treatment of him and Schuster. Mm. The Association of American Editorial Cartoonists President, Jerry Robinson, was involved in the campaign along with comic book artist Neil Adams. Due to a great deal of negative publicity over their handling of the affair and the upcoming Superman movie, DC's parent company, Warner Communications, reinstated the byline, dropped more than 30 years earlier, and granted the pair a lifetime pension of $20,000 a year, oh, wow. later increased to $30,000 a year, plus health benefits. Wow. The first issue with a restored credit was Superman number was in Superman number 302. Wow. So they do kind of reconcile. That's a happy story. A little bit. Yeah. Although Schuster was now supported by a lifetime stipend from DC Comics, he did ended up he did end up falling into debt, close to twenty thousand dollars by the end of his life. Oh. After he died, DC Comics agreed to pay off his unpaid debts in exchange for an agreement from his heirs to not challenge ownership over Superman. Okay. Schuster died July thirtieth, nineteen ninety two in his West Los Angeles home of congenitive heart failure and hypertension. He was 78 years old, but his legacy was cemented in a bold S emblazed on the chest of the man in tights. Superman is often thought of as the first superhero. This point is debated by historians. Um, there's a number of superheroes. Comic book historians. I um, love that. So Can you be one of those, please? <laughs> I could be. Um, Ogon Bat, the Phantom, Zorro, and Mandrake the Magician arguably fit the definition of a superhero. Dude, Zorro is not a superhero. <laughs> Zorro's a regular dude. That's the whole point of Zorro. I mean, so is Batman. <sighs> I guess, without all the money. <laughs> Nevertheless, Superman popularized the archetype and established its conventions, mm -hmm. a costume, a code name, extraordinary abilities, and an altruistic mission. The very word superhero is derived from Superman. Yeah. Superman's success in 1938 begat a wave of imitations, which included Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Captain America, and Captain Marvel. This flourishing is today referred to as America's golden age of comic books, yeah. which lasted from 1938 to about 1950. The golden age ended when American superhero book sales declined, leading to the cancellation of many characters. But Superman was one of the few superhero franchises that survived this decline, and his sustained popularity into the late 1950s helped the second flourishing in the Silver Age of comic books, mm -hmm. when characters such as Spider-Man, Iron Man, and the X-Men were created. Yeah. And that is the very un-Canadian story of <laughs> Superman. <laughs> You know, watching the minute, like, you kind of, like, I kind of knew that it wasn't a very Canadian, uh, like, it's not we very Canadiana. Like, uh, yeah, at that yeah. point in the 90s, they were just like, what can we take? That's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, I like that story. I'm glad the band didn't break up. I thought there for a minute that they were going to not be friends anymore. And yeah, I'm glad that they get back together. Yeah. They write Superman. They get it published. Yeah, they but, get uh, some recognition for it eventually. Yeah, and it seems like he kind of went through like some some hard shit yeah. after Superman. So yeah. I mean, it's not it's not like the prettiest story in the world, but he. I mean. It's pretty cool to create something so iconic, it's I think. It's kind of a little bit maybe part of our heritage. Maybe a little bit kind of sort of part of our heritage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to another episode and sharing my birthday with me. Even though it's not my birthday when you're listening to this, it was my birthday when we recorded it. So thank you very much. I'm currently raising the roof. She is raising the roof. If you aren't following us and you don't have a place to check out our info, you should check out our website, www.minutewomenpodcast.ca. It has all of our episodes, all of the links to our social channels, uh, some info about Grace and I, and some really beautiful pictures and all of the information Grace uses for each episode, all of her sources. So check that out, please. 
And make sure you subscribe to the podcast, whatever platform you listen to us on. Make sure you rate and review the podcast if that's an option for you. And we release new episodes every Wednesday. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Bye. Angeloon. 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 New month. <laughs>